Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, we welcome the presiding officers. Uh, shortly, we will be joined by the deputy speaker of the National Assembly, Mr. Lechisa Zenodi. Uh, we, once again, as we begin, we profusely apologize for the delay um, due to unforeseen circumstances. We recognize and acknowledge that uh, you will be hungry by this time uh, because it's a delayed breakfast. So uh, breakfast will be rolling as we are rolling with the program. So we are just about to begin Ladies and gentlemen, just to welcome you uh, once again and to say that the presiding officers of parliament, Mayor Balagambete, National Assembly Speaker, and Mayor Tandimudise, the chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, have been invited here uh, to witness the report on the performance of the fifth parliament since it started after the democratic elections in 2014 up to now. So they have invited you not only to witness the reporting, but also to interact and to engage with you as uh, important stakeholders. So the program uh, is very sweet and short. It's not that long. Um, um, there's going to be shortly uh, the welcome by the acting secretary of parliament Mayor Bebijawa uh, for a few minutes and thereafter we'll go to the core uh, to the real program which is the presentation by the National Assembly speaker and thereafter will be followed by the presentation uh, by the National Council of Provinces chairperson and thereafter uh, there will be engagement. Just to say that engagements of this nature are very key, they are very important uh, because they enable this kind of uh, uh, engagement, interaction, and accountability. Because not only does Parliament hold the executive and others to account, but it is also accountable to the people of South Africa. And therefore, this is one way of accounting to the people of South Africa through you as the key stakeholders uh, that we value. So without any waste of time, I'm going to call Memchawa to just welcome you before we go ahead with uh, the rest of the program. Good morning. Can, can we have um, the yeah. mic system? Thank you very much. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good morning to the presiding officers. Um, I think Muloto has covered everything. He has given the keynote to, to welcome everybody else. But I just want to say part of what we're going to be sharing with yourselves through the presiding officers who are the executive authority of parliament is um, them sharing with ourselves on the work that has been done by this fifth parliament. Um, the most important thing is to say um, presiding officers have had several interactions with the various stakeholders. And some of you will remember that at the first, we had an interaction in Rosebank where they were actually taking us through the priorities and policy imperatives of this fifth parliament. And indeed, what is going to happen today, we wish that you engaged, engage quite constructively with the progress report that they will share with us as on some of the things that have been quite uh, milestones in this particular Parliament and, of course, painting the way forward for the sixth Parliament that's coming on. Um, on that note, I won't waste much time. I um, wish to say enjoy your breakfast, uh, little noise, and let's listen and share views and hear what the executive authority is going to say to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mem Jawa. So without any waste of time, I'm going to, it gives me pleasure to invite to the podium the Speaker of the National Assembly, Member Legambete, to come and give the first presentation. 
Speaker. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I was uh, asking Mutapo whether there was music here because we always make a point of having some music when we invite guests like yourselves, like this morning, just to share something unusual that is more nurturing, that is more relaxing, because we are always uptight about one thing or another, which of course we should be, because uh, with the kinds of issues that face continuously our people, uh, maybe there's not much to be relaxed about. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in order to structure my briefing remarks, I'll do it around six pillars. The first one is the legislative front, the bills that have been of parliament, the national budget, and you know, we'll touch on how in that area we have uh, made progress. The fourth is the public participation, where we have uh, adopted a model, especially at the forum of the speakers around the country. The fifth is to comment on progress made in the implementation of the financial management of uh, Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act, which we, we took some time from the third parliament to process and finally adopted with amendments during the fifth parliament. And lastly, we will comment on the international work of parliament uh, uh, where we try as presiding officers to divide ourselves in the large volume of international work that parliament has to do, uh, of course, mainly through delegations based on the various portfolios of government and parliament, but also representation of parliament and therefore the people of South Africa at global forums uh, in terms of international work. So on the legislative front, uh, we, we have in our work with the Office of the Leader of Government Business continuously, constructively uh, worked together and have in this fifth parliament passed 96 bills. Uh, out of the 96 bills we have passed, only two were returned by the president. Most of them were signed off and, and uh, in fact are in the process of either formulating regulations to guide the implementation thereof or they are already being implemented. So only two were brought back by the president and that was the MPRDA, uh, as well as, there's a second one I, I have not listed here. So that's on the legislative front. We are hoping and we have indicated to the Office of the Leader of Government Business that we should not in the year before elections. In other words, 2018 is the year before 2019 be having a large legislative program. So we hope that uh, we won't have to, but of course it doesn't mean that there won't be one or two uh, uh, bills that might need whatever happens to be passed or to be considered <coughs> or some amendment, sorry. Uh, on the front of legislation, I want to also say that we as parliament internally have looked at consistently as we were passing the laws, what are the needs of our people? 
So we've been guided, for instance, by the guidance or framework of the National Development Plan to ensure that in whatever portfolio we're dealing with, those issues are taken into account. We also have been looking at ways of strengthening within our legal section, which we are looking to, you know, consolidating and, and, and boosting to become not just a section, but a division. Because when, way back in the third parliament, we had also adopted the new constitution, we thought that within parliament, we need to have a capacity on that front. We also need a, an inbuilt capacity to make sure that as parliamentarians, uh, our people here are able to initiate, to draft and to pass laws. All of that be inbuilt capacity within parliament. So that's an area of work that within uh, this term we have been uh, concentrating. We have also kept an eye on, well, I, I already mentioned the NDP, so th those were the development needs of our people. We, in our forum of speakers, who are all the nine uh, provincial legislature speakers, as well as national parliament, we decided to form a high-level panel which is chaired by the former president, uh, Halima Motlante, and ask them to help us to look at past legis key legislation we passed uh, in the past and look at the impact thereof so that we are able to write a legacy report that will be passed on uh, to the sixth parliament. We will do what is within our capacity to do while we are here before the end of this term, but it would also lay a basis for a, a legacy report to pass on to the sixth parliament. So the high level panel is going to be shortly reporting to us. I don't know what are the final details. Next week sometime, I think before the end of this month, they will be reporting to us and giving us a feedback on what they have found on the ground because they worked independently but it's about ensuring that what they bring back as feedback they are, is able to inform how we improve and the legacy report that we're going to leave for the sixth parliament. The second uh, area of my briefing is the oversight and accountability work. Uh, this work is mainly done through committees of parliament. And so we have continuously looked at how best to strengthen the capacity to boost, to improve the capacity of the committees. And we know that this is uh, not easy because it requires a lot of resources uh, to be channeled to each of the committees dealing with the various portfolio departments of, of government around which parliament through that particular portfolio committee would be exercising uh, uh, oversight. So the support we give to those committees is very, very critical. And we know that the chairpersons of these committees have continuously uh, asked parliament, please, to give more resources to make sure that more resources are, are channeled towards them in terms of research, good research capacity, in terms of good content advice from people with the necessary expertise in the various areas of the work that is done by the portfolio committees. We must say that uh, we are proud as the fifth parliament to say that in the course of the years that we have been here, uh, the oversight capacity and the openness of doing that work and the accountability of parliament was clearly uh, demonstrated in particular in certain instances when, uh, for instance, we dealt with the issues 
relating to the South African Broadcasting uh, Cooperation, uh, where in the glare of the public, we conducted the whole uh, uh, exercise and through it discovered for ourselves uh, the gem that is with us today, the public protector sitting over there with us. It was in the glare of the whole uh, country. We did a thorough job. No one can say we, we, there's something we didn't do right because we did it in front of everyone. So in this way, we've been improving how accountable and the extent to which we allow our people to see what is going on in parliament. We also ensure that the issues of oversight over clean governance are promoted in society in general. For instance, uh, the work of SCOPA, uh, Honorable Vincent Smith here in front of me, uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, when there's also Honorable Godi actually, where is he? He's not around. But he, they do ongoing very good work of ensuring that there is clean governance in the way government departments are working, in the way even any other uh, organ of state is working uh, in their own corner, in their own portfolios, including state-owned companies. The other area I want to mention is that through the Speakers Forum, we have initially worked with but have been boosting the partnerships with a stats, st statistics uh, in South Africa and uh, the Auditor General's office because statistics are very critical in us being able to measure progress or otherwise that we are making or the extent to which we consciously keep an eye on the extent to which in implementing what we have set ourselves to do on and achieve, in fact, we are sticking to what we were asked or we promised ourselves or we promised our people to do. I want to come to the national budget and, and mention areas that I think are key to mention. In earlier parliaments, I think it was the fourth parliament, we passed the money bills. Through that, we are enabled as parliament, should the need arise, to actually have a say in the national budget itself. There might come a day where for one reason or another, we refuse to pass a budget. We won't do that easily for no particular reason, just for being dramatic, but we have a, the legal platform in the money bills of parliament through which we can actually take action like that. So parliament has been better empowered and in this fifth parliament, we also have done a lot of work in ensuring the strengthening of the parliamentary budget office. There's Professor Jahed sitting here, who is the first director of the parliamentary budget office. In other words, to enable parliament to have independent information, independent support and advice from this committee, from this uh, office, to ensure that we have, we no longer have to do something we used to do 20 years ago. Go to the very same department that you are overseeing and ask them to give you the research capacity, the expertise on the basis of which you must conduct oversight. We no longer have to do that. We now have a parliamentary budget office, which of course is still very small. We think that whereas it started off by having to advise in particular four committees of parliament. 
we should now increase it, in, in, uh, boost its capacity so that it is able to actually give this advice to all portfolio committees of parliament because it can only enrich uh, 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 the work and the output of the work done in parliament. The third area I want to mention on, uh, 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 in this particular uh, uh, topic is that we have made a lot of progress uh, in our relationship with National Treasury. We even have reached a place where there's a better understanding in Treasury about how Parliament differs from a government department. There was a time for years when uh, there was always an assumption on the part of uh, 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 Treasury that when they get to having the meetings, the annual meetings that they normally hold where the minister sits with uh, his counterparts from within uh, the executive and they argue and they motivate and uh, demotivate and so on and they finally adopt a budget. Then they just decide, okay, what's left we'll give to parliament. As if parliament is just some junior partner somewhere along the process. It has now been mutually agreed that the relationship has to be based on the constitution. <coughs> and that in actual fact, having a constitutional model where there are three arms of the state, parliament, the whole legislative sector is an arm. It's not a part of an arm. You have in fact, in my book, because it all starts with the people of South Africa going to elections, electing representatives who gather here in these corridors and in these houses as people's representatives. In other words, parliament, they form an arm of the state. They, the legislative sector, because we then extend it with the provincial legislatures that play the same role but in provinces, that that is a whole arm that has a constitutional mandate that is very clearly stated in the constitution. Therefore, it cannot be treated like another government department. So that now has been agreed that that should be the basis of looking at how the national fiscus provides for the resources necessary for that constitutional mandate to be pursued. We believe this is great progress because from the next cycle, we will have a different approach to the kind of way that resources are allocated for the constitutional mandate to be pursued from the legislative sector side of things. For us, this is great, great progress. It has never happened in the past 20 years. We've had great difficulties with our budget from the national fiscus because, in fact, as the years, in recent years, the budget of parliament was cut up to an intolerable level. Of course, there's more detail on that, and uh, we have our CFO, we have our acting uh, secretary to parliament who can say more about how that has affected uh, one way or another the work of parliament. <clears throat> Public participation here, I want to quickly mention that as we entered the fifth parliament, 
in our initial strategizing exercises, we thought that as the years go, you remember 20 years ago when we arrived here in 1994, we passed a lot of laws because at that time, it was the first time that you had a democratically elected parliament. It was the first time. So you had a group of people that came with a very clear mandate to clean up what the past had put here, because those had been racist, apartheid, uh, values-based uh, uh, laws and policies. So we had to undo, at the same time, be thinking about what new laws had to replace those old ones that we were repealing, uh, which, in fact, in this fifth parliament, we've been looking very, very uh, feverishly at to, to the extent to which we have repealed every old law. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the latest report on that. We have kept an eye on that in the program committee. But <clears throat> one of the things that the Constitution, the new Constitution has, has said emphatically to us is that the people have to be involved. Our people must participate in informing the content of the output of the policies of the agreements that we make because they are about the people. They are not about just us or the elite in society. It's about how do you improve the lives of the people on the ground. And it's an ongoing uh, uh, responsibility because, you know, you cannot come one month to a point where you say, oh, now we've dealt with all problems that can possibly affect our people. No. It's, it's, it's not about to happen. It will go on and on. Our grandchildren will be mm -hmm. here, uh, and they'll still be dealing with certain aspects of the area of uh, improving the lives of our people, and therefore their own participation becomes critical in that regard. So we have thought in this fifth parliament, and we think uh, future parliaments, the sixth parliament and parliaments beyond, will do better in this area. We think we spend too much time in Cape Town. And there's been a cry from the political side of parliament among the MPs that we need more time away from parliament. We need more time in the communities, which is where our people live, which is where you get to come directly across the everyday challenges of our people. And so the way we function, the rules that we make, the programs that we agree, we adopt, must enable the MPs, yes, to be here to do those types of work that need, to, that need us to be here, but to also be free to spend as much time as possible in communities. And that's where we should make sure that we are sensitized on an ongoing basis, not just before elections in 2019, where now we need to, yes, of course, there is that time in politics. Any country, any democracy would have that moment when indeed everything else is shut and uh, political activists, activists and role players are allowed the time to go and campaign. But I'm talking about the ongoing program of parliament. It needs to open up more and more time for MPs to be in the communities. That is the, the perspective that has been developing in this fifth parliament. We have again and again uh, prevailed on our whips to implement this. And I must say, it's not uh, that easy. Some of the things are, are better, are easier said than done. Because committee time 
is very valuable time in the parliamentary program to allow committees to get into details in the oversight function over the departments that they oversee on behalf of the whole. So it's, it's very difficult and we appreciate that, that it's not something that you can just cut and paste and very quickly produce a program like the old order. The old order used to have a very tidy way of doing it and that was six months in Cape Town. Everybody moves, teachers, children, and they come here, do what they have to do in parliament, six months back home. But when we came into the new South Africa, we found that the volume of work that had to be done here in parliament is a lot more than during that time when what parliament was doing was more about a minority in society. This time round, the issues we are handling are about the majority of our people. They are about the poor, who are the majority. And as we all know that we are still grappling with issues of uh, poverty, we are still grappling with issues of inequality and unemployment. So the volume continues to require us to be more innovative, and to apply our minds more on what are the different angles from which we should attack the work that we have. So public participation required by the Constitution continues to be uh, something that we need to always uh, uh, keep an eye on. Uh, hence, us saying as we move forward, hopefully in the sixth parliament, will become more innovative and find it easier to reshape the, the, the program of parliament as a whole. The fifth and second last point is about the Financial Management of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act and the implementation thereof. Uh, it's finally in this term of parliament that uh, it has been adopted because initially it had been drafted such that it, it enabled provincial legislatures to independently have their own provincial laws for financial management. But the Constitutional Court said no, this has to be one piece of legislation and it must give uh, 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 the understanding and the framework for financial management uh, uh, for the whole legislative sector as a whole, not as a, a, a entities. We are happy to say we were finally able to implement a key uh, structure of the financial, of the FMPPLA here in Parliament and that is the creation of the Joint Standing Committee uh, on Financial Management, to which Parliament itself must account, because much as we exercise oversight over those that we exercise oversight over, we too must be accountable. And that's, those are the uh, uh, imperatives of a system based on checks and balances in our dispensation, where everybody must be accountable. Hence, uh, as I say, we have this joint standing committee, and in fact, two weeks ago, we were there together with the uh, senior management of parliament, uh, the executive authority, uh, Madame Mudise and I uh, uh, were there at that joint standing committee because that joint standing committee has the responsibility to keep an eye on the expenditure and the management of the budget of parliament itself that comes from the national fiscus. So we are happy that uh, we are making progress and uh, we can only improve and we can only do better, we hope. The acting secretary would be able to share more 
on the front of how uh, we, we, we work in this area. Lastly, and I'll just be brief on this uh, international work, uh, every portfolio would, of course, have one way or a structure where, at an international level, we interact with the rest of either the SADC region uh, or the African continent. Uh, for instance, our delegation of the South African Parliament represents a delegation of five members of Parliament, three from the ruling party and two from the opposition. And they represent us at the Pan-African Parliament. So they owe us a report, they interact on our behalf, they contribute to how Africa's legislative sector or experience is itself developing and how it in fact contributes to the growth of democracy on the continent. Uh, we, uh, we must say though, that there are two issues that are of concern to us as this parliament in this context. One is that by now we should, as the Pan-African parliament, have reached a point at which the protocol of the Pan-African parliament that was adopted by the AU uh, as part and parcel of its architecture as, as the body that is uh, guiding us as Africa, should by now be able to give us legislative powers as the Pan-African Parliament. We must say that uh, we have not reached that point. And the South African uh, Parliament uh, delegation continues to have a responsibility to help in its own contribution, Africa, to firmly reach that point where the Pan-African Parliament should not now, uh, going forward, be just an advisory body, but should, in fact, become a legislative body. And we know we have learned lessons from other parts of the globe as to how best you can get to that. It's, it's not difficult uh, 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 through using model laws. The other area of concern we must highlight is the issue of the regional parliament, of the SADC parliamentary forum, what continues to be the parliamentary forum, evolving to become the SADC Regional Parliament. The four other regions of Africa have regional parliaments. The South is the only one that is dragging its feet on that parliamentary forum becoming a fully fledged regional parliament as the generation of leaders of uh, Nelson Mandela of uh, uh, our, our then foreign minister, Alfred Nzo, had conceived and agreed and in fact adopted the architecture of SADC on the basis of that understanding that there must come a time when the parliamentary forum becomes a regional parliament. We must say that a lot of work has been done uh, we have been to, from country to country, uh, delegations of the SADC parliamentary forum leaders have come even to South Africa a, a few times. And we must say that we found from uh, one head of state to another agreement and acceptance of this idea. The only uh, stumbling block so far has been to persuade our senior managers to give the necessary support so that the, the technicalities of taking this through 
the agendas and discussions at SADC summit level are done so that in fact this can be adopted and because there's nothing that has been raised as an issue that has not been attended to. So this is an outstanding uh, piece of work that we will uh, also make sure gets the necessary attention while we are around for the rest of the term, but in particular as work that continues and must also inform the agenda of the sixth parliament. We divide our work. The other presiding officers can share uh, about the work that they've been doing. I have led delegations of the SADC Parliamentary Forum, but also I lead the delegation to the Inter-Parliamentary mm -hmm. Union. Uh, and the other presiding officers uh, have been doing a lot of work and waging lots of battles at the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, and I'm sure they'll, they'll be able to share with us uh, the progress that has been made in those global forums. So we thought uh, to give you highlights of, of the areas around which work and progress has been made during this fifth term, uh, at this point, which is the midterm report. I must say also, lastly, that back in September, at a meeting with our senior management, the presiding officers thought it fit to lead us in parliament, that is both the presiding officers and, and the senior managers, in an exercise of re-looking at our objectives because yes, we came here in 2014, but we're now in 2017. And as a lot had changed, in particular in relation to the economic standing of the country and how that had affected both the national budget as well as the budget of, of parliament. So we had to, we, we couldn't just you know, continue like we are not affected. And so we had to rethink, relook, reprioritize in particular, which we did. And uh, I'll leave it to my colleagues to, to say more about that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Demulot. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I wish now to call upon <clears throat> the chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Matt and Dimudise, to give uh, part B of the report. Honorable members, um, I am just going to be brief because I think the speaker has covered a lot of areas. I want to start off by saying that, uh, speaker, we should not be ashamed to take the credit parliament that insisted a more comprehensive meeting which will not only be and the two of us the meeting which must bring together the three arms of state must still take place with the president as the head of state convening that meeting it's important because everything that the speaker has said does not fall into place when you start putting parliament where it should be. 1994, we came in. There were about four or five members of parliament who represented us abroad, and therefore we did not really know the standing of parliaments and the respect parliaments get in other countries. We now do know because we have now been in and out of Africa and all parts of the globe, representing not only parliament, but African parliaments. Existed now for 20 years. I've been wondering why the establishers and the writers put the NCOP as it is, 
We know our strengths, we know our weaknesses, but we also know that in fact, a comprehensive report which we are working in on is the only way we will, one, convince the executive and the head of the state, ourselves as parliament, that it is the right direction to go, because there is no way we continue to play the role we are playing. Now, when you are halfway the term, you look at whether you have made any impact as a house that is supposed to have unique fit features. And you are very proud because the NCOP comes out and says, executive, hear us clearly. Mid 2018, having looked and having studied at the way laws have been passed and the way we have been blamed as the House, we're not going to be taking any bills after mid 2018 unless you bring technical amendments. And we are united as the NCOP. We are taking that position. I am sure I will not be the only one to fall on my sword if a bill emerges and we say no. We're not going to do it because we're not going to do shoddy work because we're not going to be pushing people in the public to accept a piece of legislation they do not understand or they do not comprehend. So we're beginning to see a progression from being a parliament repeal of all the bad apartheid laws. So midway, we are saying that there is a big chunk, and maybe that is why we are motivating to have a division of parliament that will help us with this legislative work. We, we must also say that the speaker has spoken on it, the move on the budget and how parliament must acquire its resources and how parliament must account for its resources. We are also saying we have, 2014, there were a lot of vacancies at the strategic levels of parliament. I'm happy to say that we have reached 86%, I'm told. It may be to level skills are impacting on the quality of committee work. Speaker, I can say that from where we were in the NCOP in 2014, the debates are good. The debates have improved. The interpretation by members, because parliament is not about the workers of parliament. The workers of parliament are cocks and screws which are supposed to enable members to achieve that which the people send us here for. So when you then look at the NCOP, you begin to see an improvement on the output of the members as it should be, not on the performance and on the sizes of the wages that we pay the workers. So it is important to look at it that way. It is important to say that we are lagging behind because of the resources to do the improvement on the work that the Parliamentary Budget Office is doing. But hey, we're not the only ones who are crying in Africa, Prof. It, when we met earlier this year with my counterparts, we found that all of us in Africa have precisely the strategic shortages of budgets given to the budget office. Is it because as parliament ourselves, we are scared of having powerfully built budget office which enables members of parliament to understand and to do their jobs precisely, we don't know. But that is the area which we think that in the little time that is left, we must do. Are there any challenges? Yes, there are challenges. We are worried about uh, security of parliament. It is now an issue which arises every time the speakers of the world come together. We do know of countries in Europe that have actually begun to follow their MPs to their homes and strengthen security there. We do know that it is South Africa that is lagging behind even in ensuring that just the constituency to the Pan-African Parliament reach South Africa. That Parliament needs to play a more leading role speaker 
in the running of the Pan-African Parliament. Cannot leave the issues of parliament and parliamentary leadership to the executive, especially when the executive has never been a backbencher and understand the legislative uh, processes which members who are backbenchers must push. So we're looking at that, but we are very happy that we were able to sway back ourselves into zero budgeting, because zero budgeting means that um, taking parliament to the people will be better resourced because we are going to plan it properly. We have improved it, by the way, it is no longer a once a year affair. It actually says that it is a pre-visit, it is the parliament taking parliament proper, it is a report back session, which means we now do three trips to a province to report back to the people what the undertakings were, so that people don't see us as spending money as taking parliament to the people and not actually monitoring whether the executive have done what they have publicly said they will do. We want to say that we have had good and bad results, but we also want to say that it has enabled us, this pro program, to identify policy gaps. For instance, we are now putting a question through the NCOP to the executive to say, for how long are you going to sustain giving out RDP houses to the indigent, to the disabled, to the aged, who can no longer go and get income to fix what gets broken? Is there something that you should be thinking about? Because if you look at countries like China, social housing is maintained by the state throughout. But then the state does not pretend to hand over ownership of social housing. You stay in that house, once you can afford, you move out and somebody who is worse off than you takes over. And therefore the state has a responsibility. And I can assure you that uh, the first time I saw the improved social housing, um, I had seen Mr. Trump's flats in New York China's social housing was far better. The blocks they were building in China for the indigenous were far better than Trump's uh, uh, flats. So there is a way in which taking parliament to the people begins to say to us, we do have the power to make recommendations to the executive. Why are we not taking that gap? Speaker, we, we think that it is important to look at our international trips as also strengthening our capacity to make better laws. Um, it is not a big issue in countries like uh, Poland for members to introduce bills. It's not a big issue. But I cannot wake up tomorrow and say I'm introducing a Tandimudise bill because I like myself. That bill must have a buy-in out there in the streets and find its way into the house through a member. And that is the difference between us. By the way, Speaker, I will be hosting my counterpart from Poland. They are arriving today. And I hope that in their journey here, members of the press will take the chance to meet up with them because they will stay in Cape Town and then move on to, Pre to Pretoria. That's for us, thank you. Copies uh, might be made available towards the end of this uh, event. But just to reiterate once again that there is breakfast. Breakfast is ready. We know that uh, some of you have been waiting for too long. Uh, if uh, the colleagues can be able to facilitate that with each, uh, each table so that uh, people can be served, guests can be served with uh, minimum disruption. Now, the presiding officer deliberately gave overview, uh, short and sweet, uh, but comprehensive, in order to enable interaction, because uh, this is not about them coming here to address you, and it's about interaction, engagement with yourself as a reports that have been given. So I'm going now to uh, open this uh, to discussion. There are about four roving mics 
uh, that will, go, will be going around each table, uh, depending on who is raising their hand. So at this moment, I'm going to open uh, for discussion and to invite the guests to participate, ask questions, make comments, compliments, etc., etc. Um, is there any? We'll start here from the uh, from the main table. <laughs> uh, the first hand. Um, you will be the second, sir. Right at the back, uh, sir. You will be the third. Is there any other hand for this round? We employ 85,000 people, and indirect employment is 350,000, and approximately 1 million people depend on us. Our contribution to the GDP is 0.7%. Anyway, my question relates to the speaker's point regarding legislation. Speaker, you did mention that 96 uh, bills have been passed, and two have been retained by the president, President Zuma. You know, in South Africa, the issue of racism, there's rampant racism. I mean, uh, the issue. issue of uh, polarization of the society. Of those bills, how many actually deal with the issue of hate crime and hate speech in terms of criminalizing those? Thank you very much. Uh, you properly. Can you just put your mic a little bit closer to your mouth? All right. Can you hear me now, speaker? Yeah. Are you OK yeah. now? Yeah. All right. All right, I'll repeat my question. I'm saying that of the 96 bills uh, 96 bill which have been passed, how many actually deal with the issue of hate speech and hate crimes. Uh, you know that in South Africa, racism is rampant. So the issue of addressing that issue, I think, is of agents in nature. Thanks. Yes. You are the second, sir. Do I stand? <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, speaker and chair of the NCOP. Um, I'm from PPF, Western Cape. My name is Mu'ad Khabir. Uh, just a quick question, Speaker. Um, you mentioned that there was a high-level panel, uh, which I actually participated in and which we participated in, um, in terms of submissions and so on. Will the report of the high-level panel be made public, or is it going to be discussed only inside the, the parliamentary uh, confines? Uh, because some of the, as you, as you know, some of the legislation that they are trying to address, as you mentioned again, um, are, you know, of, of major importance, particularly around uh, education, PIA, and a number of issues. But will that information essentially be made public? Okay. Uh, with regard to, yes. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the third hand, I think it was right at the back. Yes. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I do welcome the report that has been presented by the um, presiding officers. Um, but also I think I, maybe if they can increase the volume of your, uh, of your mic a little bit. Let me check. Is it okay? Yeah. Is it fine? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I was saying we do welcome the report. I'm Malosi Kutumela from the National Council of Trade Unions. And I will also want to make a follow-up in terms of legislative. Um, the speaker mentioned that 96, as the former speaker indicated, I mean 96 bills, were passed and two were returned. But what I want to get from the 96 are all implementable, because I know we usually pass bills, 
but you find that they are returned because they are not implementable. I just want to check how many are not implementable because we are sitting in the network, we are sitting in different task teams and we deal with other um, bills that were returned. So I just want to check in your case. We might be proud of the 96, but only to find that only 30 are implementable. Thank you very much. Okay, and then there was uh, the fourth, okay, yes. You have the fourth hand for this round, the last one for this round. Thank you very much. I also welcome the presentation from the presiding officers. My name is Nokia Chans. I'm the parliamentary officer for the Law Society of South Africa, but this is a personal Facebook and Twitter. I, I really enjoy that because I'm very active in those spaces. But I have found that in the public gallery, members of the public are not really allowed to use Um, you can go first, yes. Um, thank you, uh, Madam, for the uh, chai, but then And I, uh, we absolutely also welcome your initiatives in making sure that all branch, branches of government um, actually you know, get a fair share in terms of that. But also, in, as far as the Chapter 9s are concerned, I think two very important matters for us is, first of all, that uh, the judgment in 1999, I think it was, involving the Independent Electoral Commission is implemented the nines uh, are indeed located within Parliament because of the independence and so on in terms of the Constitution. I think that's a constitutional impact. The nines institutions should get sufficient to do their, their work. So I think also in terms of that, uh, we would like to hear your insights uh, in terms of how we can take those matters forward to make sure that all institutions in terms of the constitution is able to function optimally also in terms of the, the budget that they receive. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gum. Uh, those are the six questions, presiding officers. The speaker, will you want to go first? Uh, you can just do it seated there, Mama. Okay. Uh, the, and switch on the lapel marks. Yeah, no, I'm not used to technology. And that's part of the problem of, um, of our parliament, the slowness of moving into IT and ensuring that all members actually are okay with using uh, technology. I wanted to come in into, into the question which was put by the gentleman from NACTU on whether any of the 96 bills are implementable. Parliament must at all times try and pass laws they want themselves as individual citizens to be subjected to. So I shouldn't pass a law which is going to take away I should pass a law which is simple to understand. In 1994, we said take out the Gobli de Gook, if you remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It must be a law which then we said we must also make sure it's affordable. Things wanted on the legal division is that you, you not only get it there about the passive process. What I do like, though, Speaker, is if the budgets of the Chapter 9 institution finally go through Parliament, 
then we will get some respect also from the Chapter 9 institutions as the NCOP. Because when, when you read a report that says report to Parliament, and the Chapter 9 institutions think that Parliament is the National Assembly, then you create a problem because for those of us who not only represent the people in the province, but also house Salga, very formally during our sittings, you actually give us a backlap because you are saying you can participate in the provinces and respond to the provincial executive on matters which we have oversight on as the NCOP. And therefore, I find this disjuncture, and I usually think that people who are leading uh, uh, the Chapter 9 institutions are very carefully selected and, and don't misinterpret the law like I do. But it, it has been a very nicely puzzling thing. What do they think? We don't want to interfere with the Chapter 9s. Uh -uh. But we do want to say that when reports come, that the NCOP must also be favored with the reports from the Chapter 9 institution because we represent those people in the provinces. But the agenda is in the process. But we've also noticed that there are other implications. For example, what are the skills implications? In rural development, we said that we are going to require certain functions to be conducted by evaluators. So when we looked at the skills in the country, do we really have many? Or is this going to require us? Once you have a sense of what it is going to do. And I like what the chairperson has said. One of the things that Treasury did in the past, for example, uh, coming from local government, when it passed the financial management of uh, 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 financial um, management of municipalities, there was a process in each province and in each district of communicating that law after it was passed mm. with the CFOs in municipalities and municipal managers, so that there's clarity and understanding of its understanding. When you've done that with any piece of legislation, there are better results. Now, uh, there are always issues around how many of the departments that lead legislation do that kind of work. Because of the sensitivity of finances, Treasury then <coughs> thought it is important to do that and take it to everyone. So we need to be doing that everywhere else. But by the way, this is precisely one of the reasons why the Speakers Forum commissioned the high-level panel of experts. Uh, initially, there were 17. There are now uh, 15, uh, led by uh, the former president, Kalima Mutlante. So their report will also reflect on why has they have chosen a roughly about 100 pieces of legislation covering three broad areas. I can name that if it's required. Uh, to assess why haven't they made the impact that we expected. Is it the quality of law itself? Uh, is it the institutions that needed to be in place to back them up? Is it enforceability by uh, uh, administrative and or political principles? What is the problem? Are there constitutional or legal issues? So when we read the report, we expect to find some answers to this and perhaps proposals to us to do certain amendments. So a proper answer will come about from the high level panel on those issues. We hope that it will be a useful one for, for debating and so on. But let me also answer a question that has not been asked, but has been spoken about before, about the 96 bills. You see, there's an assumption that uh, the, uh, the, the quantitative number of laws passed is a principal uh, measurement for our performance. When in fact, it's not quite the only measurement. We have a responsibility to pass the budget. 
And through committees, you've seen the amount of time spent on dealing with that, with just the budget of committees. It's a lot of time. So you must, in addition to asking us whether we've passed the Revenue Act, for example, what has been the processes in Parliament to consider it with public engagement? We have a responsibility for oversight. The, the, the chairperson has spoken about taking Parliament to the people to assess from people's own perspective uh, about the appropriateness or otherwise of legislation and or budgets that have been communicated. That's another tool for assessing the performance of uh, this thing. Uh, when we started between 94 and 99, I remember suggesting uh, somewhere that uh, we should have a big banner that says, here's the rubbish heap of repealed apartheid legislation. Mm. And here is what is left out, uh, outstanding. Now, uh, so quantity is not a, an accurate assessment of mm. performance. Mm -hmm. We pass laws, but we must assess their appropriateness on the ground and applicability on the ground. But we must also oversee their implementation through oversight and other measures and so on. So just passing it mechanically is not a, a, a viable instrument for assessing performance. You need to consider the other factors that I've, that I've mentioned there and so on. Um, I, yeah, let me stop there. There's a long list there. Also, there's, um, social media? Can I? Yeah, which one? Yeah. yeah, social media, and then there is the hate speech. Yeah. Uh, uh, appreci we thank the appreciation of social media that you are saying finally we've gotten outside under the, under the boulders <laughs> into the sunshine of social media to communicate and so on. Uh, Parliament and its practices, questions of security and practice and have not caught up with policy and practice, including in, in Parliament, a member used a gesture in the House. And uh, as evidence, uh, the member who complained uh, received policy and what we a diplomat is threatening the sovereignty of national governments in the sense that some of the, the data they have is data over which the state have responsibility to protect, like your personal data. information. Uh, in other words, they have, these are corporations, they have so much data that it is at risk and so on. So that's the one area of interesting uh, interest that parliaments must have over tech companies and what they produce via social media or whatever mechanism they use to. The other one that is important is paying taxes. So they operate globally and somehow they fiddle with their books. They don't want to pay taxes where they should be paying taxes. So we need to oversee them as parliament, right? So part of the study group was to go and look at them, what they are doing, how we can handle them so that we do this thing properly and so on. But most importantly, the reason is that these tech companies must also be told, this is where we want your research to go to, okay? Based on the needs of the people. You must bring about uh, uh, convenience, uh, ease of doing things, do away with hard labor when there are mechanisms for doing that that are easier for human beings. So that technology is, only, is not only the result of a, engineering creativity and imagination, right? You know, engineers can be very creative. Some of you, pardon us. But we also want the people to be served better through technology. And this is why those relationships are important and that our policies must be appropriate. So we need that, uh, our policies for use of, uh, without patients of them. And secondly, of the public that voted that do not belong to those parties necessarily. So MPs would be violating that if they are not part and parcel of the participation processes and so on, to be able to give answers where they have answers, to acknowledge their ignorance where we have lots of on certain matters, but we do know who are experts in those areas and so that we can refer people to those experts who have the knowledge. So you are right that uh, in fact, 
I wanted to say that uh, the necessity for parliament to have strong relationship with the public, with people, with citizens, and stakeholders in certain areas is so that as we participate in global forums, we do so uh, with confidence that we re truly represent the people, okay? That what we have was not only the mandate they gave us during the voting process, but in between, we are interacting with the public, with people, in a manner that enables us to be confident <coughs> in our interaction with the executive and cooperate with the executive where it is appropriate. There will be those areas where we will do so and argue and debate where we disagree with them on certain matters that are principal issues before parliament and so on. So that's the necessity for us to have those dynamic relationship with the public and so on. But the other reason is that uh, governance has risen to global institutions. I mean, I shouldn't be saying this to you, you know that, that some of these global institutions have arrogated to themselves the authority to rule without being elected on people and governments in all nationalities, right? Uh, uh, even if we pay dues to the IMF and World Bank, they are unelected. But the decisions they make are binding on our countries, yet they are unelected. What oversight do we have over them? Okay. Part of the reason for collaborating as countries in the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, in the Interparliamentary Union, is to be able to agree on methods of engaging these institutions uh, with oversight to ensure that they will do what it is expected of them by elected representative, at least, at least if nothing else, they have a mandate of the community and the people in the countries they come from. Uh, so they shouldn't be acting unilaterally on the basis of their own considerations, whatever good intentions they claim they have. But in practice, the consequences are dire. So we do need as parliament, and this is what partly justifies our insistence to deepen international engagement. Because we see if we don't, then our governments are forced into a contractual relationship with some of those institutions that have uh, problematic uh, impacts on countries and their sovereignty over those issues. And we are not naive. There are things that we must cede as governments to global cooperation, okay? Like on climate change, okay? Uh, climate has no respect, has actually a, a healthy disregard for boundaries of whatever kind. Uh, uh, so we had to cooperate across the nations, agree on reducing pollution of rivers, you know, of the air, and our, we must talk to our uh, economic actors to do so in an environmentally sensitive manner, to respect uh, ecology and ecological sustainability, because if they don't, uh, all of us perish, uh, including with their profits. Thank you, madam. Okay. I uh, just wanted to come back into the communications. I think one of the things that um, is gripping the world is the ability of some parliaments to live stream. Namibia is already doing it. So it's not just about Twitter, it's not about whatever. But the importance of it all is that as parliament in South Africa, we need to go back to our rules and, and re-look at them. If we say that our rules say you shouldn't be using your, your cell phone in the house, and at the same time we are saying, MPs, please get on with it. Mm. Uh, and some people do their speeches mm, on, the phone. on the phone. That contradiction, we need to go back to our rules and, and fix. Now, if we are saying whatever is said in our committees and in our, in, in, in our chambers on the floor is already open to the public, and you still have a rule somewhere, if I'm not mistaken, Speaker, which says, um, unless the Speaker has given you, for the National Assembly, permission, certain publications cannot be used. That was when the, the, the communication was largely based on the written word. Now we know that parliaments actually own their TV stations. 
and, and therefore, as South Africa, we, we need to start moving that way. Reclaim our channel, run it from parliament as all the other parliaments are running their own stations. Tanzania does it very effectively. Um, my favorite country, Russia, does it very, very effectively. <laughs> I thought I would see you nod on our own stage. Because let us face it, put the politics aside, it is how parliaments are structured and resourced that fascinates me. It's not the politics out there. It is how they are enabled to do their work that some of us want to focus on. Uh, I, I didn't mention that uh, parliament had, uh, uh, in association with UNICEF, and the uh, United Nations uh, uh, Center for Human Rights, and a statelessness uh, conference. Now, that was a very important uh, uh, international conference. Um, as we come out of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, there's a huge uh, problem of refugees coming out of Myanmar into Bangladesh. Over 1.1 1, 1 .1 million of them are now stateless inside uh, uh, Bangladesh, illustrating the problem of statelessness that arises from the problems inside our countries. So one of the biggest issues that we discuss in these forums is conflict prevention, the prevention of trauma that arises subsequent to war. Those people there, are traumatized in the conditions in, in which they live are very problematic. Despite the valiant efforts, including by South African Muslim organizations that we found there who were there to provide humanitarian help, it is really uh, good that we must appreciate the contributions that enabled those South Africans to take humanitarian help to Bangladesh to help those refugees from the, uh, the Rohingyas and so on. But I think a more lasting solution is when our governments and our parliament proactively take action uh, to communicate to the leadership of Myanmar to allow people to return to their homes, whatever the situation is, so that we prevent um, uh, the problem of statelessness and the trauma that it visits on those who are affected so negatively by those things. Uh, so in a sense, we thought we should raise that to show that some of the work we do in parliament has major ramifications. And as we come back in Zambia, as we speak to you, there are over 100,000 people from, from the DRC because of conflict there, uh, who, as we're speaking, uh, require huge humanitarian support. So any support that South Africans can give, at least if nothing else, but via the humanitarian route, that's an important one. But we mustn't abandon the political efforts that are necessary to prevent those conflicts and reverse uh, the, the negative um, uh, migration that is visited on the people because of uh, uh, whatever uh, p policies inside those countries, and they therefore cross boundaries into the neighborhood, creating huge pressures uh, of all kinds in those countries. I thought I should just raise that and draw the connection between the work we do inside parliament, but also with conditions in these various countries in our neighborhood, here and internationally. Okay, before the next round, we'll just mop up part of what remains. I want to link the issue of the first question on hate crime and uh, hate speech and how you deal with that through legislation with the issue of implementability. Because, you know, there are areas where you can't quite legislate for people's behavior because you would not be able to police that, to make sure you know, people don't do strange things uh, at certain points in a day in a person's life, in their bedroom, in their home, in their factory where they relate to their workers or employees and so on. So I'm trying to just say, 
implementability must also be related to enforceability. Are you going to be able to enforce this thing? Who are you going to be sending around to be making sure uh, uh, the way people talk to each other is decent? And to say ways of dealing with some of those challenges in mm -hmm. everyday life, in society, in communities, is something that we've got to be engaging with as South Africans on an ongoing basis. And I think the more we have cases where, for instance, a judge lost her job because of racist comments on, on social media, I think. What's, what's her name? She left not very long ago. She lost her job. Hopefully, that's going to be a lesson to other people. And that way, as South Africans, as citizens, we continue to improve as we learn lessons to what happens when you do such and such. You know, and, and indeed, we should be intolerant of hate speech. We should be intolerant of any of the ways of doing things that are not in keeping with what we believe is what we believe in as, as South Africans, uh, in terms of our values, in terms of how we conduct ourselves in any uh, uh, forum, in any place as, as decent South Africans. And, and those are the things that when we come together in committee meetings, we talk about, we, we exchange, we stop each other from doing wrong things. That way we improve. Children are watching. That's why sometimes I get very concerned about the conduct of adults who are in public spaces because our children watch a lot of TV. And when we conduct ourselves in a manner that is despicable, we teach children that that's the way to do things. Children, you know, are very impressionable. They can just easily think, oh, okay, I saw so and so do that, you know, so I, di I do it myself. So now on whether we have passed any laws that apply to these issues that I'm, I'm raising, I think we, we could circulate a list of the 96 bills, what they are, what they are about, you know, and, and, and group them into areas of life where they will, uh, because also one of the good things that we do when bills come to us in parliament, we, we insist that as the member of the executive is finalizing the bill and it is being forwarded to parliament, it should be clearly stated in a memorandum, uh, in, in an explanatory memorandum, what it is about. Because the objects must be very clear in the mind of the person who is the author. So that we can already also, when we then do what we call tagging as presiding officers, are able to determine that this is a section 75 because it has implications as to where you introduce it in parliament. So if it's a section 75, it then means it goes to the National Assembly for introduction. And the objects are very clear, and, and in fact, it makes life easy even beyond the passing in parliament, because you then, for it to be implementable, make easy for that stage of implementation by ensuring that those who must write regulations that indicate the further detail. You know, in a piece of law, you don't write a very detailed uh, a list of things about where do you take it next? You know, what's the next step? Who is going to be involved? What are the bodies out there in society that will be involved in implementing this bill? That has to go into what you call regulations. And the regulations will make it easier beyond passing the bill in parliament. The report of the high-level panel will 
at a certain stage uh, be made public. You know, I mean, we, we are generally a dispensation that is public in the way we, we do things. We believe that our people must be part and parcel of the processes that are about them to start with. So, indeed, the report, not immediately. They'll first report to the speakers' forum, and then they'll come to the stage when we make it public, and we will also formally introduce it to the structures of parliament as well as the, leg uh, the provincial legislatures. I think most questions have been covered. We can take a second and last round. Can I, can I just add, uh, 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 can I just add, the high level panel has divided its work into three categories. The one is social cohesions, legislation that relates to and impacts on social cohesion, which may include issues of uh, hate speech and related issues will be covered there. And the, the second one relates to uh, land uh, redistribution, restitution, and security of tenure. So that's uh, uh, the second uh, group. The third one relates to poverty, inequality, unemployment, and economic growth. And so factors that, uh, that relates to the economy, for example, and its transformation would relate to this last uh, group of, uh, of work. And that's what they will, legislation that is relevant to the impact on poverty and related issues uh, will be dealt with in that group. So we hope that they will also produce summaries or, and highlights of each of those three sections so that uh, stakeholders who operate in those areas can also usefully immediately engage with those issues and give us their observation about the findings that emerge from that high level panel. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. As you will see from the issues that I have been covered in both in the presentations and the questions, uh, or response to questions, that those are issues relating to oversight, lawmaking, public participation, international work, as well as improvement of uh, parliament's administration. So those are issues that are at the heart of uh, the fifth parliament strategic plan. So. Uh, it's very important to know that. So uh, I will appeal again to, to the colleagues that uh, to assist tables with breakfast, like taking orders so that there is as minimal disruption as possible, so that you, we, be, we begin to take breakfast to them rather than to be standing up and down uh, going to the breakfast area. So if we can assist in that regard so that we don't have guests uh, continuing to uh, to struggle with hunger. Um, can we take the last, the last, the second and the last round? You will be the first, ma'am. Se second, General. Uh, you want to come again? Okay, you will be the third one, and then, ma'am, you will be the fourth. Any more hands? Cedric, you want to be the fifth, you are the second bite. And then, ma'am, at the back, you will be. Uh, we must start with the first biters. Okay. First biters, we're going to be. So, you will be the fifth, ma'am. Any other hand? Any other hand? Because this is the last round, so you are not going to have another opportunity. All right. Going once, twice, okay, you will be the sixth. <laughs> Public protector, you will be the seventh. Uh, so those are seven hands, and then two of the seven hands are second biters, so you will be the two last, two lastest. <laughs> so you, Cedric, and uh, Mr. Jeff, uh, you will be the last. So can we, in that particular order, in that order that I've called, if we can uh, begin with the first, uh, we started here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, honorable speakers. Fadla Adams, I head up the Parliamentary and International Affairs Unit at the South African Human Rights Commission. I have two questions, noting your comments around children and your international engagements. The first one, relating to children, 
is that about two years ago we submitted, together with UNICEF, a multi-party children's caucus proposal. This was following the dissolution of the Ministry of um, Women, Children and Persons with Disabilities. We have not received much positive feedback from Parliament on that, noting that uh, children's rights in this country need to be placed at a quite a high priority, particularly within the legislative sector and at Parliament. That's the one issue, so just feedback on the multi-party children's caucus proposal. The second one and it relates to the international engagements, and I appreciate all the feedback that's been given around Parliament's activities on the international front. But what I find um, maybe not coming through so strongly is to what extent is Parliament exercising oversight on the executive and relevant government departments when we have to report at the international and about the United Nations Human Rights uh, Council, um, African Committee uh, on Human Rights. Uh, last year we saw South Africa appearing before the Human Rights Committee at the UN. We appeared before the Committee on the Elimination of Ra Racial Discrimination. We appeared before the Committee on the Rights of the Child. This year, we submitted, or rather, the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights submitted a list of issues to us after we submitted our report. We appeared before the Human Rights Council last month. The Deputy Minister of Justice um, and Constitutional Development was there. And next year, we appear before the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the Committee on the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And what I find um, not coming through from Parliament, particularly in the debates and deliberations in the House, is that there is a general misunderstanding or non-recognition of the recommendations coming through from these international and African bodies, which speak directly to our human rights situation in South Africa. Um, there's also a disjuncture between what is happening on the domestic front and what is being portrayed internationally. I won't go to in, into an example now, but last year at the Human Rights Council level in Geneva, we found that we had abstained from a certain resolution on LGBTI matters. When it got to New York, the, the third committee at the UN um, in New York, we again didn't participate and stating that we weren't supporting a particular resolution. And then at the last minute at the General Assembly level, suddenly we supported a resolution saying um, it's in line with our constitution. So that disjuncture doesn't make us look very good on the international front. Um, which is uh, concerning for us and how we are portrayed as a body internationally. So just to wrap it up um, on the international questions, it's really just to know to what extent Parliament is ex exercising its oversight, calling the government departments to account, getting progresses on the implementation of recommendations. Some of those are time bound, and so we have to report back to the committee by a particular date. Government does not adhere to that. Um, similarly now with the SDGs, there's some activity around that. To what extent is Parliament taking on board the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that we have to um, also integrate within our work together, of course, with the NDP and everything else. So yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the first question. The second question. Thank you, facilitator. A very good morning to the presiding officers. I'm Lieutenant General Bonang Mkwenya, standing in for the Acting National Commissioner. Uh, we have noted the concern regarding security in Parliament, and uh, um, we will be ensuring that from our side, we engage the, the, the other role players. In particular, from the SAPS, our interest is the, the, the outer perimeter, but there will be an engagement also with the, those that are responsible for the inner perimeter to say, how do we evaluate the current situation? In case they will, in a situation where there would have been a, a security breaches, what is it that we're supposed to have done and uh, might not have done, and how are we going to ensure that we, we enhance the current situation towards ensuring that the, the concern is uh, taken care of? Uh, I am saying that also taking into consideration 
that uh, the, the, in terms of deployment, uh, with the, the pronouncements uh, from the Department of National Treasury where everyone will be affected, the, the, it necessitates a reduction in numbers within the SAPS, uh, which uh, might at times affect uh, 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 deployments. However, that does not necessarily mean that uh, we will be abrogating our responsibility of ensuring that uh, the, the, the uh, uh, people of South Africa, uh, uh, and, uh, they feel safe, but also would appeal to say, while understanding that all of us there will be a cut, uh, within the SAPS uh, we have uh, these porous borders which uh, we have to, to police and also the expanding uh, population and, and we are a labor intensive organization and such will have to be taken uh, care of. Uh, we are making this appeal, taking advantage of the supremacy oh, of parliament. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, the third question. Okay. Morning. Uh, my name is Mandy Samesa Joazungu from the PPF Western Cape. Mine is a clarity question, a follow-up question to the point that was made earlier by the Deputy Speaker, and this is pertaining to the skills in the country. You mentioned that evaluators uh, would, for an example, be needed in the country, and certainly uh, an assessment of the impact, economic impact of the laws and the bills that are being passed. So my question then is, to what extent um, do the laws and the bills that are passed in parliament ma make sure that a mathematics education is protected, make sure that mathematics education is relevant, and that relevance speaks to the fact that, for an example, the pass rate of mathematics can just never be 20% if we want to make sure that in this country we have a, a high skills base, if we want to make sure in this country that we have evaluators, if we want to make sure in this country that we have a high economic impact. To what extent then do those bills and those, on those laws make sure that mathematics education remains relevant? That is the question. Thank you very much. Uh, the fourth question was at the back. Uh, it is towards the back. Uh, good morning, uh, program director, the speaker, and the speakers. My name is Mdua Kayatrisha. I'm coming from Black Business Chamber. Uh, we are basically representing uh, small businesses, you know, in townships, you know, uh, across the Western Cape. But my question is specifically is around uh, the public uh, participation processes. Uh, because as people who are opera operating in townships, we usually find out that some of our members do not get, you know, uh, this information actually to come and make some submissions for certain, uh, for certain uh, 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 bills, you know, that have got to be passed you know, in Parliament. Because our, our people are usually people who are confronted with uh, daily struggles and all that. So they, you find out that, you know, sometimes they miss out even in listening to, you know, to, to, to the news, you know, in the radios and all that. So my question now is, what can Parliament do to make it a point that, you know, uh, uh, people in townships, even those who do not have, you know, access, you know, to these communication channels, get an opportunity, you know, to be informed, to be informed whenever, you know, a, a certain le legislation people have got to, to, to put their inputs, you know, without relying, you know, very much on these, uh, on the, on, on these electronic, you know, uh, uh, media devices, of which sometimes, you know, I mean, they fail to have access to. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, fifth question, I think okay. the... Um, uh, yes. Good morning, presiding officers. My name is Lule Gamatoa, 
and I'm representing South African Swimming Academy, a non-profit organization which has about 1,500 beneficiaries around the Western Cape. So I have a few questions. My first question is, is there any development with regards to work ensuring that um, the schools are engaged? Export in, in, in schools nationally. So my second question is: I work towards ensuring that the swim program becomes part of the plan. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with uh, the panel didn't get it properly. Uh, Ms. Matua. Matua. Okay. Uh, can you just repeat it? Okay. The question. <laughs> Based on what the speaker has mentioned you know, concerning um, the statistics national development plan, I would like to know how do I make sure that the Learn to Swim program forms part of the national development plan? Yeah. That's my first question. <laughs> Land redistribution program. Okay, uh, I think the last uh, two are the second biters. You start, and then you follow. Sir. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, public protector. I know you were the last before the two. Yes, uh, it's your turn, public protector. Oh, thank you. Thank yes. you, Program Director, yes. um, Presiding Officers. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I would want to find out whether the report does address the issues of um, um, when you do the oversight and especially taking Parliament to the people or the complaints which are dealt with. Uh, there is a number of uh, concerns about service delivery related issues which are as a result of not um, implementing various institutions' uh, mandates. But again, there's issues of various departments, or we account to portfolio committees, and you find that um, we are not um, uh, complying to the very same targets which we've set. What are the consequences out of that? Um, or in your uh, deliverables, have you achieved in making sure that there's consequence management. You come, you report, you haven't achieved your targets, you have a lot of uh, irregular expenditures, and um, then life goes on, or what have you done to deal with those issues? But again, on the issue of legislations, um, I think um, your legal section, or the ones which you've recently established, if they can also work very closely with the especially traditional leaders, uh, because I think there's a lot of gap there where you find that traditional leaders also have a lot of uh, uh, input or then taking the laws or getting the inputs of the people, especially from the, from the rural areas. Because what I've picked up when I was engaging with them was that you'll find that certain laws are passed without their uh, uh, inputs and you find that they will have an impact on the very same people which are un in their respective areas of, of jurisdiction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Public Protector. Um, yeah. Presiding officers, I'm informed that uh, the, the question by Ms. Matwa, uh, it was not, I misheard her, it was not a land redistribution program, it's land, land to swim program. Land to swim. Learn to swim program, yes. I, th I, th I thought uh, 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 it had to do with the land. Okay, the last, the last two questions. Uh, did I overlook you? Uh, or uh, it's, it's, it's a, uh, you just want, okay, uh, it's additional hand. You were number five. How have I been counting? Because I thought that I had uh, seven hands. Okay. So you are the last uh, 
uh, of the last biters. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Program Director and uh, Presiding Officers. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Rifta and I'm from FEDUSA. Uh, there are specific issues, Madam Speaker, in terms of your initial presentation that you made, focusing on the eight specific pillars coming from Parliament in terms of the report. Now, the first three specifically are quite profound in terms of the legislative format, the oversight and accountability, as well as the public participation. And whilst we're looking at... Uh, uh, looking at quantitative outcomes, not necessarily, sorry, qualitative outcomes, not necessarily qualitative outcomes. I'm quite keen on trying to find out from you, in your approach where you say that there should be a dynamic relationship with your public participation process, and at the same time linking implementability to enforceability. The question remains, when you want to strengthen the capacity of your committees, to what degree or to what extent are we looking at moving towards overall satisfaction of the outcomes? I take a look at two specific examples citing the Western Cape in particular. Um, it's quite dynamic in the fact that um, when you want to take Parliament to the people, how specifically, also in terms of your, or in terms of South Africa's international obligations to the ILO, we look at those two case points. First and foremostly, in terms of the ILO, 2017 has been deemed the year of reporting on occupational safety and health. Now, in terms of the quantitative legislation that has been passed, the 96 specific sets, one of those have been the Criminal Matters Amendment Act. Now, in terms of enforcing, we are looking at applying the principle of a consistency where you find the issue of metro rail being an extremely sore thumb. The legislation is in place, but in terms of enforceability, in terms of putting necessary measures in place, we are not necessarily seeing the desired outcomes. There's a crisis, there's an outcry. And on the second front, in terms of OHS, once again, in terms of the capacity of the committees, what are we doing in addressing the situation with the emergency medical services in this province in particular? Once again, there's an outcry. We are reaching critical situations in the country at this point in time where the people are looking at Parliament in terms of exercising and enforcing that accountability role that has been given to you. What are we doing? Um, we've had great engagements with the committees um, in terms of certain pieces of, pieces of legislation that have been quite progressive. But currently, we are being hamstrung by certain activities that are decreasing the ability for us to move forward on economic activity. So in terms of public participation, you're saying you, uh, you, you enhancing the fact that taking parliament to the people is a priority, but how do we address those two in light of the fact that you want to strengthen the capabilities of the committees to deliver on those capacity constraints? Um, as FEDUSA, we've already put through requests to the committee, and um, you know, whilst we note uh, the hamstring in terms of what the committee can do in terms of its programs, what are we doing to move beyond those borders? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, just to indicate again the issue of breakfast. I don't, I don't, I don't want to begin to sound like I'm forcing you. Uh, there is, I'm told that there is a buffet this side and there is another one this side. Um, uh, I thought that there will be ushers to assist, uh, but I'm told that uh, you can just quietly uh, move towards uh, either of the two uh, to dish. Uh, it's very hot, it's very nice, and I'm sure we can talk while we are eating. We can multitask. Two last hands, Cedric. Cedric, Cedric Mboisa from South African Sugar Association again. Deputy Speaker alluded to the issue of a socio-economic impact study being conducted before a, 
a bill is passed. But there are credibility issues. You have the initiator, a government department, and the relevant industry. So my question is, ideally, who should conduct that socioeconomic impact study? Because if it's conducted by a government itself, there will be some question marks from the opponents. And then if it's conducted by the industry as well, the government will question that. Should it be conducted ideally, or should parliament look into the possibility of conducting its own study as well, mm -hmm. taking into consideration that parliament might not have enough capacity and resources to do that? How do we handle that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, colleagues, as you stand up to go to the breakfast areas, can we do it quietly as possible, as possible, so that we can still have a discussion, a decent discussion, uh, while we are eating? Uh, and we don't have to stand up, all of us, just uh, in few numbers, and uh, try to do it as quietly as possible. Thank you very much. The last hand. Thank you. Hello. Can you put the mic on? Okay. Uh, thank you again. Uh, just a, a question of clarity um, to actually both the uh, speaker and the chair and the deputy chair, uh, deputy speaker. Uh, what is the the position of national legislation in relation to provincial legislation? So the pro the re relation of national legislation to provincial legislation. Um, and the reason I'm asking is <coughs> some, uh, and it, unfortunately, particularly in the province that we are in at the moment, um, of the opinion that provincial legislation supersedes national legislation, um, effectively believing that the Western Cape is an independent republic. Um, I just want to know if this is actually the case. OK, thank you very much. I think. Uh, those were almost 10 questions uh, for this round, uh, presiding officers. Uh, are you starting, uh, Deputy Speaker? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to uh, say that unfortunately we have not made progress on the caucus idea of children. Uh, we were meant to have done that. The issue has been uh, referred internally for processing to decide what is the best location if we were to go for the uh, children's caucus. In the meantime, in one of the, in the last strategic meeting of EXCO, uh, we made a recommendation that uh, in the rules, there's provision for what we call focus weeks. Uh, during which we identify a theme, and that becomes what we look at as parliament. It becomes a theme for the whole week. So we invite stakeholders from across the board, committees, look at that theme from their specific lenses and so on. And we recommended that it be children. So we're hoping that uh, when that happens, uh, that date and time is agreed on that focus week, the answers that we are looking for. Uh, because it is both an internal and external one. Uh, part of the reason that is a problem is the, let's call it proliferation of structures and the efficacy of handling each of the issues under their mandate. So that's the difficulty. But uh, it's on the agenda, it has not dropped. The second of your question is a very interesting one because in our, in our last discussions, with the uh, institutions that support democracy. One of the issues we discussed is that they also raise concern about their reports being discussed in parliament appropriately and debated. But also we discussed the question of reporting responsibilities, as you are saying correctly, to the UN agencies and other bodies like that. But we were also doing so to say that those reports must have been debated in parliament they must be representative of what the Parliament of South Africa looked at before they are taken. We mustn't hear about them uh, on social media. The South Africa reported this, A, and so on, and so on. 
And uh, incidentally, Madam Speaker, if I may say to you in public, I've just whispered to the chairperson here that uh, I wrote a note to the Minister of International Affairs that uh, there's a meeting outstanding between us, uh, the presiding officers and the minister, because there are things that we are doing as parliament on the international front that we need to communicate to them. When committees travel overseas, they interact amongst others with embassies there, but there are issues in some of these bodies that we would like to share uh, with the, uh, 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 the, the minister appropriate so that uh, this matter about the coordination of our reports is also discussed there so that we agree. These are the time frames. This is what we agreed already, that uh, these are the reporting timelines. So this is how the parliamentary program should look like to be uh, debating, discussing those issues before they are passed, passed on and so on. So we must go into the next step, which is implementation of that program and those issues. Uh, just to say that on the public participation, uh, uh, there's a couple of issues that we need to be able to do a lot of work on. One of them is what others call information literacy. In other words, how do we know where to get what information on what matter? How do we deal with those issues? Who can we go to? If it is about parliament, who can we safely go to? The MP in his constituency office or her constituency office? The website, if, it's, if you don't have a website, how can you get there? Where can you get? Who best provides you with reliable information that you can use to make your decisions? That's the first part. The second related part is the political literacy. Do you understand the political system? Do you understand where the key decisions are made? And before they are made, what are the processes that lead to that process? We need to do work around that issue so that people understand in order to influence the budget cycle, for example, at what point sh should you start? You can't start uh, after October when the more or less things are almost solid. Very little will change instead of starting at a particular time. So we need to do work around that, that our public participation model also produces information that helps people to deal with issues in an effective manner. Um, uh, I want to also answer the question about uh, learn to swim. Ma'am, incidentally, last year, uh, the biggest number of deaths were apparently as a result of drownings, uh, water-related issues, drowning. And so there are many people who drowned because they couldn't swim. There is a general policy about water safety. And so we must not underestimate the value of what she is saying. In any disaster management strategy of any municipality, any district, it will be failing in its component if it does not have learn to swim for its program. This past weekend, I gave about seven boys I, to my classes, so I added to the money they had in order to enter a swimming pool because it cost them 12 rand and they didn't have it uh, because they were in there to continue their learn to swim lessons in that swimming pool. But unfortunately, uh, there are very few of those swimming pools where you need, we need them. Infrastructure is inadequate. It's not appropriately serviced so that it makes our kids in our neighborhoods able to swim and therefore likely to survive in case of them getting into the water and so on. So it's an important part of the integrated development plans. That's where it belongs and thereby ought to become a plan of the province and the national in terms of the resource allocations and so on. It is in that way and integ uh, integrated to uh, government planning processes. Um, my last question is the last question about uh, monitoring evaluation, the complexity of who should do what. No, government must do it. Uh, we must do it where we can do it, but also both of us as government and parliament, we are supposed to be doing monitoring and evaluation. In the speakers forum, we have adopted a monitoring and evaluation framework each of the legislatures must distill it into a specific set of activities that informs our monitoring and evaluation. It includes those issues that come up uh, now and then.
abilities today. Okay. If we, if as a municipality, the Cape Town city will look at vulnerability, what is the likelihood of children drowning? How prepared are we to reduce the instances of drowning? Okay. What has happened in the past in the programs to provide that training? So that you make an assessment based on which your next uh, budgeting process includes resourcing for that particular issue. So monitoring and evaluation of programs would pick up those things that we haven't picked up by way of vulnerabilities that are new, that we didn't think about before, but because of climate change, we have to look at them seriously. But swimming has always been a problem and therefore ought to be part of that process. I suggest that we don't have to quibble about who must do it. We must all do it in one way or another. But of course, sometimes you don't have to do the impact yourself because others have done it already. So if government has done it, we want to improve its credibility, we must uh, institute steps that can help, help us handle the, those issues here. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> the, um, just want to touch on the, the UNICEF children's issues. In any parliament, your international parliament, your international committees, your finance, your public accounts, your health, your education, and your security cluster committee, those become the busiest committees. International becomes the most industrious committee because it has oversight on all policies which have any impact on, on the international, all treaties, all agreements, all MOUs. So irrespective of whether they are on health or whatever, as long as they are international, they via international. So there is no way that the South African parliament can agree that issues which go to the UNICEF have not via through our parliaments using the two committees in both houses that deal with uh, uh, international affairs. If that is a situation, then we need to go and find out what has happened. On whether or not the caucus has agreed, you know, in 1994, before the, mini before the ministries were in speaker, you will remember a discussion which took place within the ANC. And at that time, we were quite unashamedly pushing the issues of women, children, and people with disabilities here. What you are talking about was the first proposal that was put on the table to come up with a ministry on women, children, and disability. And one of the first groups to fight against that proposal was people living with disabilities because they said, what is this thing? And it was also an argument that we went into to say, why do you think that women must always be seized with the issues of children? When are you entrenching in the mentality of South Africans that children are everybody's business? But finally, deliberately, the proposal that won was to come out with CGE. Very deliberately because, and I still think we were correct then, that once you agreed to a ministry on children or a ministry on women, you are actually killing this. What has happened right now is that you do have a ministry of women. What has happened is that women are at each other's throats because the ministry is not delivering. What, why is the ministry not delivering? Because the ministry is not resourced to do what it should do because the economy is not delivering in such a way that you are able to afford all ministries in all our issues that we need to be addressed. So I think we, we need to be very, very sussed. We need to begin to say, do you, every time you have a problem, establish a ministry? Does it solve issues? Or does it create expectations on the street which we are hardly meeting? So I think South Africans need to, at some point, come together and say, how do you address issues without proliferating structures? 
So that would be my take on that, but I would s still say that, yes, we need to look at the way the speaker says that is the way we as parliament can look at it. Have focus groups, have, have a, a sectoral parliaments, whatever it is that we call them these days, deal with the issues. But it does not mean that any committee of parliament cannot, within its portfolio, look at the issues which affect people with disability, cannot affect the issues of children, cannot affect all across the board, any portfolio committee, any select committee can do that. The important thing is that you need to have an appreciation, if you are a chairperson or a member of a committee, of the powers which are vested within the committee to exercise that power. Now, if you have committees, you can have 2011 committees, unless the committees are free and feel free to exercise the powers which they currently have, and they have enough powers to do that, then you are not going to address all these things. I then want to come back to, Brigadier said that uh, the issues, I think the issue I'm raising around security around parliament is not the petty theft that we are experiencing. I don't know how many times there are break-ins in the NCOP. Um, I don't know how many times cars park here and they are broken into in broad, broad daylight with the police around. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, one, the, that across the world, parliaments are feeling vulnerable. That threats which generally used to go towards the executive have now turned a way of coming even towards the public representatives. And that is why parliaments are beginning to relook at security. Gone are the days when anybody at any time could walk into the parliamentary precinct without going through an x-ray and without somehow seeing a sniffer dog passing. Because, because there are people in the world who have decided that the soft targets of any country are their parliamentary precinct. That is why it is necessary for us to look at that. But it has also an issue to do, Speaker, with the separation of powers. Um, I get very agitated when something happens around the precinct of parliament, and I see the minister of police running around, because they should get permission from us to say you can run around in our precinct. Because there is that separation. So I'm saying that yes, we value. What we would like to see happen in Maponesa is that the police that you are seconding to parliament understand that the head of parliament is the speaker of the National Assembly and the chairperson of the NCOP, full stop that they cannot import and do things as usual because here is hallowed ground as far as the, the legislative sector is, 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 is concerned. That you cannot save summons, that you cannot arrest, that you cannot search unless you have been given certain intention. So sometimes we get the impression that the police are here the discussion about parliament being a national key point is, is also very interesting to note because it is, again, a mood point where we are discussing. It, we shouldn't be discussing it. It should be. We shouldn't be worrying about security of parliament, the two of us, and wondering how we are going to finance, what we need to finance. You can't have members of parliament and staff members of parliament feeling violated every time they leave their cars or their offices. That must stop. We have had incidents in Max buildings where complaints were people entered and we think people stole from us or our offices have been entered. That must stop. I then have the next one. Public protector, the taking parliament to people. We actually and I want to link it with your question also, ma'am, from uh, human rights. Uh, the NCOP does not look at what is on the calendar internationally. 
we look at what we think the people in a particular province have serious need of. 20, last year, 2016, we went to the Eastern Cape, deliberately focused on education because our research and our observation over the years had been that the Eastern Cape was always lagging behind on issues of education, especially the metric results. And we wanted to satisfy ourselves that Parliament has not folded its arms and said, yes, you are failing Eastern Cape. So we went near. And we can tell you that we know that some of the issues that the Eastern Cape face are not of their doing as a province. And that is why we've been very vocal on the issues of concurrence of powers in the provinces and at national, that there needs to be clarity because we then, as parliament, need to know who exactly we hit and who exactly we don't hit. You have schools which are crippled because somebody takes a decision at a national level and the people on the ground cannot. You have schools where policy is, you, you've got special schools, therefore you need specialized uh, personnel and equipment. But a discussion at a national level is, it is a school. Therefore you furnish it and you equip it like a school. And that doesn't begin to address. So we, we, we then bring in the executive. The executive from local government up to the top, they commit. We follow them. We follow the commitments. We don't say to them, please commit. They tell us what they are going to do. We follow them up. We do find issues where, for instance, the irregular expenses, whatever, whatever, we do follow up. So the committees of both the NA and the NCOP get the reports. The executive, whether their portfolios were mentioned or not, get the reports. And everybody then can use the reports and the information that we get to follow on. We go back to the people after the commitments. I can tell you, uh, Western Cape is here. They, when we went to Eden District, they went all over. There was an old lady who complained that her door does not close at night and she is scared. Now, that's not government business. But that door got fixed. The old ladies got a new door which locks and she felt secure. And that is the joy that we have. Last weekend, um, the remains of people who, 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 who yeah, who fell in action through the NCOP, badgering in turn, were returned to the Eastern Cape too. We are now following up on issues of old housing. We are following up on issues of pit toilets. In the Eastern Cape, as we left, the toilets were being fixed. We are not satisfied, and that is why we are going back. So I'm just simply saying that taking parliament to the people does bring things to the fore. But remember also, um, public protector, that we do get to sit with the Auditor General on provincial audits as the NCOP. We get a look at municipal um, uh, uh, um, issues. And therefore, if the NCOP had enough resources, we would be able to do our job very well, bring the mayors here, Bring those CFOs who most of the time mess up because they are not properly qualified. We would be able to follow up. And that is why amongst the things that we on the table, uh, Speaker, be, please re-look really at how you are populated. Probably you are the last. So we know everybody's door to do that. Are we resourced for that? No, we're not. Capacitated even in personnel to do the job that people who leave the employment of the NCOP, we to do.
who does the social impact is neither here nor there if government is going to get involved. If the people of South Africa are going to be impacted upon by whatever it is that is going to come in, then we've got an interest. If it is an SOE, I come from a province where once I heard an MEC saying, you have no business in asking me about my SOEs. And I said, they don't come from your pocket. And, and the legislature has every right to You don't own them. That is one, the constitutional responsibilities of making laws, not just passing laws, of making laws. Now, to the traditional leaders to consult. In the process of us making the laws, or are we going to the traditional leaders to make the laws with them? I'll tell you why it is important for us to get clarity there. It is because as we do the public hearings, we do the public hearings in communities which are led by the traditional leaders. Before we get there, we acquaint the, pub, the traditional leader. The traditional leader facilitates our access to the communities. And therefore, there is no way where you will say that the traditional leader is, in fact, left out. I know that there was the minerals. bill which has come back. It's a very interesting uh, uh, a bill because I can tell you that communities actually have different takes on it. If you go to Abetswana, the Kosi is not an owner of the people. The Kosi is a custodian on behalf of the people. Therefore, the Kosi does not have the final say about the mineral resources of this place. So, 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 so it is very important for us to begin to interrogate these things before we say, wholesale, go and consult the traditional leaders. If the traditional leaders send the committee of parliament away and say, no, we're not interested, this is what we are saying. And the public, Jan Eleman's view is different from that of the traditional leader, what do we do? What is the responsibility? It's a fundamental question. What is the, the responsibility of a public representative? It is to get inputs. It is to make the laws. The fact that in South Africa, most of us, as public representatives, are not lawyers, puts us at a disadvantage of then sometimes shopping out our responsibilities to make laws. I want to argue that what we need to do is to listen to everybody. It is then for the public representative to be so capacitated to come out with the end product of a bill which they think they have done their best to represent those people that have sent us here. And those people cannot be overwhelmed by business because business has money, overwhelmed by uh, uh, traditional leaders because um, no, it must be in the best interest of Jan Aleman, the laws that we pass as parliament. That would be my take. Uh, I have to go back and look at what's left. I, I have a word on children. I think the issue is very important. It is too important for us to be casual about it. And as parliament, we believe that what we always take into account is this society, its challenges. If you look at the things that are happening to children today in our country, then that issue must inform how we think about the proposal that's being made about children. I'm not even sure that a multi-party caucus, just a caucus, 
is what you need children in, in South Africa today. I think we need to have very clear minds about what in fact in the interest of what we need to do for South Africa tomorrow because today's children are tomorrow's MPs who will be operating from here, are tomorrow's leaders, are tomorrow's ministers, tomorrow's presidents. How will they have been molded by this society in terms of a society where children, some of them are found uh, locked up in, in, in cuckoos because the parent has gone, to fan, gone out to try and find something to eat for them. In the meantime, that child gets raped, gets abused one way or another. How in our communities are we providing to make sure that as a community, as a society, we are looking after our children, mindful that they are tomorrow's adult. Are we busy molding a Tsozi? Are we busy molding a, an adult tomorrow who will be a very bitter adult, who will be ch killing our women and children? To just very quick, just feel good and takes care of the subject of children. We know that in government, the issue of children is spread out in different portfolios. But I'd like us to really, now that we're hoping that there'll be a better way of looking at the budget of parliament, because also when the proposal came, it was at the worst time in terms of the budget in parliament to be able to create a structure that must be given the necessary support in terms of research, in terms of expertise in the area of children. So I think this area of children is just too important because it's actually about our future. Everything we've fought for, we must be able to make sure that those that we will be looking after in that portfolio will be able to take forward the things that people have died for. We mustn't recreate the problems that we see in society right now by just not caring. This thing of children are not there to be heard, they are there to be seen. You know, so you really don't, you don't care about this human being because it's just a mere child. I think we need to have a, a lot more respect and really caring about this human being because this is a human being. And young as they might be, they actually are a human being that has rights already. Universally at a UN level, we've agreed about the rights of the child, precisely because we are mindful that there are ways in which we ourselves as adults must change our attitudes about children. So that's the first point I want to, to touch on. On the issue of, uh, which was raised by somebody who was coming from the perspective of small businesses over there, how do we ensure that our people have more, the ordinary citizen, access to the work of parliament, what's going on in parliament, understand also how they fit in? Because, you know, one year we were doing door-to-door -door campaigning here in, in, in Cape Town, and I discovered that Captonians, people who are just down the road from parliament, are not aware they have a right to come to parliament. They have a right to come and attend committee meetings, sit in on committee meetings, be informed, and get to understand the workings of this institution that works on behalf of our people. So I think that 
basic information is very important for South African citizens to be aware of. Now, some three parliaments ago, I think, we introduced uh, in only three provinces what we call parliamentary demo democracy offices. Parliamentary democracy offices. What's the difference between a parliamentary democracy office and a parliamentary constituency office. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Constituency offices are offices which through money allocated by parliament to each of the caucuses. In other words, if there are five parties in parliament, each of them are allocated certain, a certain amount of resources to make sure that they are able to run the life uh, determined by the specific uh, organization or political party here in parliament. So every caucus meets on Thursday, it's got a caucus office, utilizing the resources that parliament has given to each of the parties proportionately according to their strength as determined in the election. So that's constituency offices. Although there's no constituency based electoral system, but we have that way of looking at how we allocate these resources as the institution. Then we introduce the Parliamentary Democracy Office as something that is about Parliament, and that is the administrative side of Parliament, not the political side. What it means is that in that particular province, we identify an area where is in the back of beyond, as in, you know, where people sometimes don't even know that there's democracy now. They've just always lived this mundane life. They go to the river to forget about uh, 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 TVs and information in general. So you create this space where parliament creates an ability for information to be drawn from here not in a party political uh, way, but in a parliamentary administrative way to get information to communities and enable communities to interact with that office so that office keeps them informed about things. So that office tells them that right now there's a very important piece of legislation being debated in parliament we should create a way for this community to come here one day and in fact, as far as is possible, also use the, I remember we used to have uh, these videos, a session of all of us sitting here, but we are being addressed by someone who's sitting in Pretoria. Make that possible, take it to those underdeveloped areas where otherwise nobody ever gets there. Because people tend not to want to go to areas where it's difficult. You know, mainly in the most rural provinces, mainly in the places where nobody wants to go, nobody wants to know. We have those three offices existing in three provinces, but we haven't had resources to spread them to other provinces. At a certain time, when some of the MPs thought, no, 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 uh, uh, bring that money back, let it come and beef up the constituency offices. We sent people to go there and see whether they can close them down and they went there and came back and said, hell no, there's no way we're going to close those offices down. The, the role they have and the place and the appreciation of the communities where those offices exist, there's no way you are even going to begin to close them down. So what remains, which in fact in the fifth parliament we started to discuss, is 
to now get more resources and spread this facility around the country so that you, apart from people coming to Cape Town, like the people from different uh, stakeholder organizations that are here, you also have a way of going out there and being among the people as parliament, not as a political party. So I'm saying there's hope for the future in terms of what we call the PDOs, Parliamentary Democracy Offices. I think all other questions have really been covered, except to add to the socioeconomic impact study. I would put it that I believe at the core, even of the study being done by the high level panel, is precisely to see what impact, especially socioeconomically, has the work of parliament had among and in the communities of our people in South Africa. What difference are we making? What is it we are achieving to do the things and to have the effect that our constitution and our different laws in different portfolios are demanding of us as the people that have been elected by the electorate and have been brought here to do and to focus on this particular area of work in the legislative sector. So I think I, I, I should leave it there for now and to say this is not the last uh, interaction with the stakeholder organizations and uh, if you allow us to, we would like to join you at the tables. Speaker, uh, <laughs> Madam, before that, uh, Madam Speaker, before you before you make your final word, uh, you and the chairperson, there are two questions that I think we we we, we, we should respond to urgently. One of them is on uh, the ILO's occupational health society, and given the example of the emergency workers being stoned, uh, delivers. This is a good illustration of the. Uh, uh, sustainable development number 16, I think it is, Partnership for Sustainable Development. This is an area around which as institutions, as organizations, trade unions and so on, we should be uniting to give them prominence because it is at the hearts of what otherwise we often defer to the Human Rights Commission and so on. When people are not able to work in appropriate conditions, with appropriate equipment, and they must themselves be safe in doing so. So in our homes, uh, whether the people who do work in our homes are, are given protective clothing, for example, and so on, that's part of it, but also in institutions, public institutions and private institutions. This is the work that we should be doing, and in fact lends itself to an activist campaigning legislative sector in collaboration with a variety of stakeholders to ensure that we, we do, it does matter, the safety of people, whether around water, as someone said, for example, uh, around whatever else they do, we should pay attention to that. The, the maths thing, I have, in my personal opinion, and politically, generally, there is no way, we can't take the question of maths uh, lightly. It is at the heart of what should be happening in teaching people critical thinking skills. So we can't uh, undermine its importance. In the identification of the Presidential Infrastructure uh, Coordinating Commission, which reported for the first time to Parliament uh, two, three weeks ago, is an identification of critical skills. And all of those skills have maths at their heart. Uh, for their successful implementation. You can't go and become an engineering, an engineer, as an example, without mathematics, I mean, uh, science and maths and so on. So it, it's a critical part of the work. So the fact that we are saying we want those skills, we, it's one of the requirements for assessing uh, in the delivery of infrastructure, uh, whether we are also building those skills, it means 
appropriately, whether we are also educating people to occupy those bands and so on. So there's no way we can drift and push aside mathematics and hope that some other fuzzy fuzzy thing will replace it. There's no way that will happen. Yeah. Those are the only two questions I wanted to answer. Nothing more. <laughs> allow us, allow us to join. Okay. Me. As a closing, can I ask for a round of applause, please? Uh, uh, that is to round of applause to yourself and uh, to the presiding officers for such a lively engagement. I'd like to thank the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, and the Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly for the presentation as well as uh, the comprehensive responses. I also thank uh, the distinguished guests, the House Chairpersons, mm -hmm. Chairpersons of uh, Parliamentary Committees, Chief Whips of Political Parties, Honorable Members of Parliament, Representatives of uh, Chapter 9 Institutions, Representatives of uh, Security Cluster, the Representatives of the Trade Union Federations of our country, the representatives from business, NGO, civil society, members of parliament, members of uh, the executive management under the leadership of, uh, uh, as well as staff under the leadership of the acting secretary to parliament. Thank you very much for ensuring the success of this uh, engagement. Uh, this engagement, as we've said, uh, and the presiding officers have said, is not uh, a once-off. It is a continuing and it is part of a parliament and the presiding officers accounting to the people of South Africa through a variety or wide range of stakeholders. So uh, in this regard, uh, I would like therefore to declare this session closed and uh, to invite the presiding officers to join you and to interact with the guests uh, through breakfast. Thank you very much.